Hey y'all, welcome to Church Online. We're so glad to worship with you today. No matter what's going on in your world right now, let's just take this moment and give all of our praise to God. It's a good day. It's a great day to worship the Lord. Let's go. Jesus, we lift up your name. Oh, come on, sing. Everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs compassion. A love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations. Yeah, Savior and Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. you find me with all my fears and failures fulfill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender oh, I surrender and say My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, heroes and conquer the grave, Jesus conquer the grave, and Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, He is mighty Broken as 
my life may be I will give you every piece and I hear you for my life, God. It's all yours. But 
we don't ask what you can do for us tonight. But Lord, we just say, we are yours. We belong to you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. Love your presence, God. We exalt you. In Jesus' name. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Church Online. We're so glad you could be with us today. Welcome, welcome. I'm, I'm thanking you from the bottom of my heart for tuning in. We have something very, very special for you. For the very first time online, we are bringing to you Jace Robertson from Duck Dynasty, everybody. He was here recently and gave a wonderful message that I think you're going to enjoy. So please check this out. I tell you, it uh, kind of warms my soul. It's a little fire in the spirit because I have not been doing events because of the coronavirus. And I thought everyone had postponed. And my assistant said, no, we, we, we actually have an, an event. I said, where's this at? <laughs> Longview, Texas. <laughs> so I'm feeling a lot better about Longview, Texas. Now, look, I say that. I've been wearing the mask. You know, at first I, I fought it just because a lot of people who don't know Jesus, they've attached their salvation to a mask. These are the same people that say, look, I work out and I eat right. And I say, okay, you'll die healthy. <laughs> Some of y'all not getting this, all right? <laughs> it's going to happen. There's a problem. So my dad always says, well, we have something called, I hate even calling it this, eternal life insurance. But this insurance is different than the insurance that you know about because this insurance is a guarantee. It's called the Holy Spirit of God. So we wear the mask because, okay, some of our older members, you know, this may be the one thing that puts them in the grave, but... The bottom line is, if they're in Jesus, they'll be back. We're coming back. <laughs> so I'm not worried about that. So that's why I said, yeah, because someone said, well, you're going to do this during the coronavirus? I was like, yeah, I'm just happy that somebody will have me. <laughs> I'm tired of these Zoom meetings, you know, it's just kind of weird. But you know what? Same message, same Jesus. So a lot of y'all... Yo, you can relax because you can say, well, you don't look like a preacher. Great analysis. <laughs> I'm not a preacher, but I'm a believer. One of my favorite verses says, 1 Peter 3, 15, because my biggest problem, and everybody has a biggest problem in life. You determine that. Now, there's a few of you that your problem is you don't know what your problem is. We'll get to you later. But for the, most of us, well, mine was being shy because I was, I was born into a family that did not have Jesus at the center of their life. And all I saw was a lot of drinking, a lot of fights, and a lot of flickering lights. I actually didn't plan on that rhyming, but it just, it happened. <laughs> and it just happened over and over and over. A lot of tears, a lot of vehicles that were wrecked, a lot of bruises, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of running, a lot of chasing. And it just, it just happened over and over. So as a young kid, I just got real shy. I learned to keep my mouth shut and head down. When I saw my dad, I ran, no matter what I did. So naturally, what happened was my biggest problem was I was really shy. My number one fear in life was public speaking. And here I am today. So you say, what in the world happened? It's weird about the Almighty he takes your biggest weakness and turns it into his strength. 
So I'm not going to take any credit for anything. It's the power of God. I'll explain how that happened. Now, if some of you have seen our show, yep, well, look, we got a new show now, uh, and it's taken off just, just about as much. It's in the virtual world, which is weird is because it's me and my dad and my older brother. Are we, we have a, you know, everybody has a weird brother. <laughs> this guy, I kid you not, he's clean shaven most of the time and he wears khakis on purpose. <laughs> Hangs out at beaches. I mean, he just, he's a weirdo, but we love him. <laughs> so he's like the moderator and then me and my dad talk. And uh, I think it took 50 episodes before my dad realized that this was actually going out to other people. <laughs> he said, what do we keep doing this for? So it's called Unashamed, but uh, you can check that out. But a lot of people, if you've seen that or you've seen the show, you've seen my wife. And uh, you think, whoa, because you just can't help it. How did that happen? <laughs> So I'll explain that. And then you think, well, how did the success of the show happen? You know, what's weird about my life is that my dad, and I briefly touched on it, and I, I don't want to sugarcoat anything. As a kid, I hated my dad with a passion, and he deserved it. And when you're a kid, you don't know any better. And so all of a sudden, you know, when you're living in sin, you start making irrational decisions. And one of the decisions my dad made was he said, you know what the problem is? It's my wife and these three kids. Now, my younger brother would come later. So he kicked us out. Well, we were the only good thing that he had going. So living a sinful life, you do stupid things. And so we left. My mom got in her vehicle. Middle of the night, we drove to West Monroe, Louisiana. She pulled in the church parking lot. She wasn't a church person. She didn't know what denomination to look for. She's just looking for some help. And fortunately, there was a pastor there, and he said, we can help you. And so he said, we would like to share Jesus with you. Of course, she had heard about him, but had never really taken the time to stop and consider and we'd also like to share Jesus with your husband. She's like, good luck with that. <laughs> so they helped her financially at first. They got her a place to stay, but, you know, they didn't want to enable anybody. We're not in the enabling business. They got her a job, started working, three kids. She started carefully considering Jesus. And she did what all of us have to do at some point in our life. And the way I ask people to do it is to, if you closed your eyes, you don't have to, but if you did and you pictured God, what would you see? What I found out by doing this for the last 30 something years is the number one answer. Does anybody know what the number one answer is? You can fire off. We're all friends here. Huh? So you say, when you picture God, people say, see, see your dad. It's not, that's not the number one answer, but I have heard that one before. Some people see a light. That's the number one answer. Nothing. So when you start thinking about your kids, and you're like, well, I'm wondering why they're not you know, trying to do what's right and serve God. Probably because when they picture God, they're not seeing anything. They are seeing their friends. They are seeing Facebook. And so that's why when I said introduce Jesus, and I was going to quote this verse earlier, and I will, in your heart set apart Jesus Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So that's the short version on why I'm here tonight. But do this with gentleness and respect. And so... When you close your eyes and you try to picture God and you see nothing, here we have, and what they shared with my mom, they didn't just read her some Bible verses. 
Fortunately, they introduced Jesus because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You say, oh, so if I want to know what God's like, evidently whoever this Jesus is, he is God. He is the image of God. So I'm going to teach you this because you might be like me when I was a kid. I thought this was a rule book. And most of the people who had it in their hands seemed angry. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to do was anything to do with that. And I thought maybe it could be a collection of fairy tales because that's what one of my buddies told me in, in school. It's all a bunch of made-up stories. They didn't have enough room on that ark to get all them animals on there. Well, somebody made that stuff up. What I came to find out later, they were wrong, that it's a love letter from God Almighty to his creation. Humans, that's us. He's for us, not against us. I don't care what that guy, angry guy said. And I come to find out that if you want to understand what the point of it is, I'll give it to you in less than 60 seconds. So if you've had trouble with this, like I did, I'm going I'm to tell you, I tried to read this thing hundreds of times when I was young, and I never got past Leviticus. Couldn't get past it. So what does it mean? And then a fella, I heard him say this. It really helped me out. He said, you want me to explain that to you? I said, I'd love to know what it means. He said, Genesis to Malachi says Jesus Christ, God in human form, the image of the invisible God, is coming to earth. I was waiting for the rest of it. He said, that's it. Now, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of stories. But the point, he's coming Matthew to John, Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God, he's here on the same earth you're on. You find red letters. I don't know whose idea that was, but that was a good one. You'll find every time Jesus talked, you'll see red letters. One of the answers that I've never gotten, which is depressing when I ask people to imagine God when they close their eyes because I didn't really answer that question. What are we supposed to see? We hadn't seen Jesus. Well, he was, he came from a virgin, but he was a normal fellow, Middle Eastern. Isaiah said there was nothing that would draw us to him. He was not, wasn't like the movies. You know, they always make him, they find the best looking guy they can and he just seems weird. Sound like to me he was a normal fella. He was a carpenter. He built houses. He emptied himself, and he became a human. Now, we know later that he did that because God can't die. He's eternal. So you say, well, why did he become a human? So he could die. This is when I started getting up on the edge of my seat when I was hearing this. So Jesus Christ, the image of God, is here. And then Acts to the Revelation... Anybody want to take a guess? Let me review, because I don't want you to miss this. He's coming to the earth. He's here. And whether you believe it or not, you count time by it. Must have did something. And Acts to the Revelation, I heard it. Coming back. <laughs> so you know what the natural question is. There's two kinds of people. I mean, you just learn the whole Bible in less than a minute. You say, I need to get to know whoever Jesus is because he sounds pretty important. He's the image of the invisible God. He came here and he's coming back. Now, wait a minute. That's 2,000 years ago. Something's not adding up. When you close your eyes, the answer I've never gotten is red letters. You can see those. I went to Israel, I read this, I looked around, they said, here's the Sea of Galilee right here. All those stories I read in here, I was like, huh, I could, I could imagine that. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. 
So contrary to what you might have heard in church, he's not going to whisper in your ear. You know, you say, well, I, I hear voices. Yeah, it's, you got a brain up here <laughs> and you can do that. <laughs> so I'm waiting on God to tell me. What else could he tell you besides give you the image of who he is and give you four books filled with red letters? And the more you read them, guess what? The clearer the picture becomes. You say, well, how come I'm not doing that? Because you know if God is real, things change. That's it. That's why I said I'm not a preacher. You know why? You know what the biggest difference in me and a lot of preachers and the, and the difference in what I do and a lot of people do in ministry is when I go and meet with the brothers on Sunday, you might say go to church. Technically, you can't go because we are the church. Jesus is the head. But if you want to say that, okay, I never say that. When I go there on Sunday mornings, I rest. I'm resting. You say, what are you resting for? Because most of the people in there are in Jesus. You say, what are you resting from? Now, during the week, I'm introducing Jesus. That's, that's the biggest difference. You say, well, why are you making a point out of that? Because I believe God is real and God's eternal and he sent Jesus every day of the week. It's like if sitting in a church building made you a Christian, then sitting in a duck blind would make you a duck hunter. I've taken people duck hunting. Guess what? They're not duck hunters. They're just visiting. <laughs> so half the events I go to, they're not Christian sanctioned. They saw Duck Dynasty. They charge for people to come in. They come in and say, hey, let's go hear that Duck Dynasty guy. Well, I hold this up. Everybody's looking around like, I've literally had people all with a beer in their hand thinking, should I sit this down? <laughs> now, we had church <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> you say, why are you introducing Jesus to him? Because I believe we all got something in common. We're all made by God. We're made in the image of God. We're all going to reach an age where we start messing up. We got that all in common. And I believe that Jesus died for everybody. And then after Jesus died, he come back from the dead. Now, I'm not going to say he was raised from the dead because in John 10, he said, I have the authority to give my life and take it back up. You just think about that. That's some red letters for you. I thought, I might ought to start following this guy. <laughs> he came back from the dead? Yep. There's a way to duck hunt forever, possibly? Yep. And he's coming back? Yep. And he'll give me the spirit that raised him from the dead? Romans 8, 11, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me. I'm in on this. So my mom heard, she was introduced to Jesus. She was cut to the heart. She surrendered. She was baptized. Now, you know where I'm from, I'm from the woods and the water. We don't, we don't wait for the baptismal service, you know. We're out in the middle of nowhere. We introduce Jesus, and people accept Christ. And we say, look, we got a burial ground out here, cemetery out here behind my dad's house. It's called the Washita River. <laughs> and we take them down there. And it's pretty awesome. So when my mom heard that, she said, go get him. Well, this pastor got with my dad's sister, and they drove to the bar that he had leased. That's how he made a living. And it wasn't a nice bar. And in that bar, while my dad was sipping on a tall slit, I believe was the brand, 
They introduced Jesus. I probably wouldn't recommend that now, you know. I wait till they come out, but that's what he felt like he needed to do, so he did it. And my dad was crushed. He was crushed in a good way by the good news of Jesus Christ. That he wasn't just supposed to be here wandering around trying to get drunk, high, and get laid. He looked around and he had lost everything that was important. And he had a moment of clarity. And that's what Jesus does. He started thinking about what's going to happen in the end. All bad. Even if you don't believe, guess what? what's your options? We're going to freeze you and you're going, they're going to fix me later? Good luck with that. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, my spirit is going to become engrossed in the energy of, of how I was made because actually we were made from this energy that was floating around that had sparked life. Good luck with that. They teach our kids this in, <laughs> in school, and it sounds just as bad right here. So you're like, no wonder they're panicking. I look around like, oh, we have a virus. People are panicking. Of course. This is an opportunity to introduce Someone who can give them confidence and security. Because he said death is not a problem. So my dad drove down to my mom's work. And for the first time in her life, she saw him shed tears. And he said, I want to get my life right. I want to surrender to Jesus. And... In an effort to make a clean break from his past and his friends and his whores and the list was long, he said, I'm going to move to the middle of nowhere. It's called Mouth of Cypress Creek. He still lives there today. And despite having two master's degree and the talent to be an NFL quarterback, which was a side issue, it was a different issue, he didn't want to play football because they play football during duck season. I don't care what you're offering me. I'm out. True story. <laughs> he moved down there and he said, I'm going to work hard. Well, let me back up. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to work hard with my hands. And I'm going to try to get my family to heaven. And anyone that comes down here, I'm going to assume they're lost. That was kind of a joke, but not really. Because when I'm telling you it's in the middle of nowhere, if you get down there, you're lost. He said, I'm going to share Jesus with everybody I see, everybody that the Lord sends down. here." So he fished the river. He had this idea. He said, I'm going to build duck calls that sound like ducks. How many of y'all duck hunt in here? What do the rest of you people eat? <laughs> Chicken? Chicken. Deer. Y'all sound like Willie. <laughs> you know why Willie's a deer hunter and I'm a duck hunter? All you can eat buffet versus appetizers. Have you seen Willie? He looks like a whiskey barrel. <laughs> he said, that deer I can eat a lot. That little duck, not much on him. I'm going to be a deer hunter. That boy loves to eat. My dad came up with the idea because he started reading this. He said, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to work hard. He fished the river. Didn't have much money. But he read in Genesis 9 that hunting is not an accident. It was a plan. It was God's plan. Read Genesis 9. After Noah and the ark, what happened? There was an announcement. You can go home and read it, but I'll quote it to you because I love it so much. I have it memorized. God said, the fear and dread of you, he was talking to the animals. I mean, think Lion King. Up until this time, humans and animals were getting along. But he said, from now on, after the flood. So a lot of you, I can tell, you're, you're even questioning that this is in the Bible. So this will be a good experience when you read this. God said, the fear and dread of you will fall upon the beast of the earth, the birds of the air, the crawlers of the ground and the fish of the sea said the fear and dread they're gonna not like you they're gonna be wild 
Whatever the fear and dread is, I took that to mean when they see a human, they better run. You say, why? Because the next verse, it says, everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, and I'll give you everything. So at a few events, I'll have somebody, you know, probably not in Longview, but I've had them. They'll say, I'm protesting that you're shooting those little ducks. Protest! No, that's not what they say, but you, you can imagine. I say, I got orders from headquarters. It was his idea, Genesis 9. So, look, I love animals. We don't eat them all. I have pets, you know. They're delicious, but they're also, we have a responsibility because I read from Romans 1 that you have God, humans, animals in that order. Read it. The lie is when you worship and serve created things or you elevate the animal kingdom above humans or God. We basically have it backwards in our society. There's some places where they value an animal way more than they would an unborn human. And God, never. And you're like, well, what happened? Well, read Romans 1. There's a lot of corruption and a lot of immoral behavior that spawns from that. But before you get too high and mighty, remember what we all have in common. We all mess up. We all gather at the cross. That's why you say, well, what do you think about this social injustice? I say, I put everything in the hands of God Almighty and in the life of Jesus because at the cross, we all gather under that cross. I don't think anything was as bad as humanity killing the creator of the world who was perfectly innocent. And what did he say? I'll tell you what, when I come back, I'm going to burn you to. He said, Father, forgive them. It's the greatest love story ever. We don't like it. It makes us uncomfortable because we always want to get somebody back. Or we'll say, yeah, amen to that. And then your neighbor will come up there and cross the line when he mowed the yard. And you say, hey, hey stay on your own property. <laughs> What happened to all this love stuff? And you, you know? So it's nothing that we hadn't been saying in my family. You know, when I surrendered to Jesus, I became colorblind. It just happened just like that. So a lot of people say, well, how's that, how long has that been going on? Well, if you go back and look at my wedding picture, you'll see I have my best men there. I had four Caucasians, and I had one African-American. A lot of people look at that, because I heard people talk. I'm out there. You're talking about some hillbillies. Where my dad lives? You say, why does that happen? We're all made in the image of God. We all make mistakes, and we all gather at the cross. That's what we do. If you're in Jesus, you're my brother. I didn't notice what color you were after that. And so we've been preaching this for years. But the world, they're looking around. They say, we could just all be equal. We all be one. That's what brings us together. That's what Jesus does. And he's for us, not against us. So my dad started building duck calls. And they said, well, that's not going to work. Because you see, in the duck call world, to win the world championship duck calling contest, that was the prerequisite for building duck calls. And some of you, I can tell, have lost you because you're eating chicken, you ain't eating ducks. And I told you I love a chicken because when people who come to me who don't believe in God, I say, so let me get this right. Millions of years... We're talking dinosaurs, natural selection. You know, the strongest will survive. I'm sitting on my back porch. I'm looking at my chickens pecking around in the yard. And you're telling me after all this, the chicken made it? (laughs) 
address that and then we'll continue. There's a chicken place on every corner. Everybody loves to eat those things. How did they make it? The dinosaur didn't make it. But that chicken. So I had a boy, didn't believe in God. He said, you know, they're tougher than you think. I said, wait a minute. So now you're going to defend the toughness of a chicken? People will digest a lot to keep their habits and their pleasures going. They just will. It's just a narrative. You do the same thing. You do the same thing. That's why I got on the Sunday morning Christians. It makes me nauseous. It makes the world nauseous. They see you act one way when you go in the building. Especially your kids. And they're thinking, boy, he sure does act different when he leaves. What's going on? Because we, we, you got it worked out in your mind. Oh, I, I put my time in. Now, I'm, now it's my life. What happened to this? You were made in the image of God stuff. So they, they told my dad, they said, you'll never be successful because my dad made fun of people who win the world champion duck con contest. He said, I'm aware about that. I'm saying if you want ducks on your grill, get one of my duck calls because they sound like a duck. They said it'll never work. So if you ever go to Stuttgart, this is what you'll hear. This is what they do. <laughs> They just keep, it goes on and on and on. I got all night. So I didn't want, I didn't want you to think the reason we don't sound like champions is that we couldn't do it. You, see? you just heard, that's what you're going to hear down there. Same thing. Now some old boy said, yeah, but I'm better than you. Because he'll take this and go. <laughs> he just raised it up a little bit, you know. My dad said, here's the problem. Ducks don't do that. <laughs> they don't do it. Why are we doing this? <laughs> I'm sorry if you've ever entered a contest, but I'm just, why are we doing this? So he came up with the idea, and it came from reading his Bible. And every duck that's edible on the flyways, he came up with a duck call. That sounded like he made his painted pieces of plastic become real. And look, and we're honest with people. We would have people call our company and say, hey, what kind of duck call do you recommend to, and I'm going to use this terminology because if you're not a duck owner, you won't know what I'm talking about. There's, there, they'll say, these ducks are lighting wide, and we need to walk them in there. What call do you recommend so I could walk them into my decoys? And I'm like, well, well, let's just back up. Move your blind to where they're lighting and save your money. Because <laughs> it's more important to be in the right spot than it is to sound like a duck. That's where the beards came from. See, this, because if ducks see you and you have a gun in your hand and you're looking because people look at ducks, He's not coming in your painted pieces of plastic. You say, why? Remember Genesis 9? They're like, you better fly away from there. There's four men down there with guns. Uh, they've lost their cousins, their uncles, their ancestors. They know. Boom, 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 boom. They know. So we got to get hid. Way more important than being good on a duck call. So God provided the greatest camouflage for the face. Right here. And you duck hunt during the winter. Guess what? My face is warm. So it wasn't. You said, oh, I thought a TV show came out with that. No, we just wanted to be hidden and wanted to be warm. That's it. So people said, well, how come you're growing a beard? It's doing that on its own. <laughs> how come you're shaving it? <laughs> I'm a man created by God. So I don't want y'all to feel bad. Look, there's a place for smooth-faced people in our society. It's called the ladies' room. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I save money, I save time, and guess what? 
Nobody tries to mug me. Number one, they don't think I have anything. And number two, it just ain't worth it. They think, that boy looks like that. He'll hurt you. So that's how the beards came about. We were trusting God, working hard. And then one day they said, boy, y'all got a bunch of characters. Why don't y'all get on TV? Okay. We're going to love God. We're going to work hard. We're going to love each other. Why don't y'all do this? No, we're going to be who we are. And through the years, it evolved into what you saw in Duck Dynasty with a prayer at the end. She said, well, how did this change your family? I bet it ripped you apart, you know, because now all of you got plenty of money. Yep, we had some good opportunities to do some grace giving. That's what that was. But I was fortunate to come from my background and see a hellraiser and have no money and see the transformation that Jesus Christ can provide. I didn't learn about God in the church building. God doesn't live in buildings, Acts 17. He does not live in buildings built by hands. doesn't live there. So I act the same way in there that I do in my house. That's where it's way more important. You say, yeah, but, you know, I'm going to learn about God on this cell phone. Yeah, you can. There's positives. There's positives to a church building. There's positives about a cell phone. But, boy, you don't have Jesus in the center. You're going to do a lot of cutting up on that cell phone. <laughs> Am I right? I've already taken away two of my kids. I said, let me see your phone. I'm, I'm. No, I'm paying the bill for this phone, right? Ain't your phone, my phone. I, I paid. Let me see what's going on. Whoop, corruption. Two weeks. Two weeks, no phone. We got corruption here. They didn't think I knew how to do it, but I know people. <laughs> and so with my daughter here a couple years ago, I just became her. So I went to her little you know, TikTok and Snapchat and talking with all the friends, you know. I was like, boy, this, this conversation needs some Jesus. There was a lot of four-letter words. I said, I'm going to introduce a five-letter word, Jesus. <laughs> so my brother called me after all the smoke had cleared because I had all her friends, and I said, if you want to continue being my daughter's friend, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not who you thought I was. I'm her dad. You will need to come here, and we'll have a talk where this relationship ends. And to my surprise, most of them came. You said, what'd you do? Introduced Jesus. They cried. Moms cried. A dad never came, which was sad, but it was the mom and the daughter. So Willie called me one night, and he's like, my daughter just come in and said something weird. I said, what's that? He said, Uncle Jason's preaching Jesus to people on Snapchat. <laughs> I said, well, I didn't even know she was there. So I give the phone back. Guess what? <laughs> Same thing. Bad decisions. So guess what? She don't have a phone. It's weird. She talks more. We play games. You know, there's a two-week withdrawal period, just like any addiction. <laughs> and I've had these people say, yeah, but I want to know, you know, where my baby is. Tell them where to be. <laughs> Until they make better decisions. I don't hand kids guns without any training and say, good luck. Cell phone, way more dangerous. I'm not saying I'm any better. If I was their age and you handed me that and I could see sex instantly, well, of course that's what I'm going to do. So it helps you make better decisions when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. So here I am. You say, well, the one thing you did, you answered how the show came about. It's a God thing. He wanted to get Jesus to the world. He chose us. Wasn't our idea. It's a struggle for me to get my family to heaven 
because I speak so much about Jesus outside the walls that I have to have come to Jesus meeting in the walls of my home. So I, as soon as I leave here, I'll go see my wife and my daughter. I'm going to ask her about Jesus. Because in the end, it's every man and woman for themselves. Just because I'm sharing Jesus with you doesn't mean she's going to fall in love with Jesus. So the last thing I'll say is how I got my wife uh, in closing. Because even though my parents came to Jesus, what about me? I'm filled with bitterness, hatred. Even though my dad changed, I'm still mad. I'm just mad just because I'm mad. I start cutting up, not heavy, because I'd already made a decision. I ain't getting drunk. And you know, I'm 51. Guess what? It's never happened. Didn't learn that in church. I just looked at my dad and said, that's stupid. Ain't doing it. Never done drugs. You know why? Looked at him and said, that's stupid. Never cheated on my wife. That's stupid. So thank you, Lord. The best way is God's way. So I was, I'm as attracted to the opposite sex as a, lot of you, uh, as a lot of you are. And I met my wife because I decided that after I surrendered to Jesus, I had gone to my dad, I read the red letters, I fell in love with Jesus. He walked me down to the graveyard, my dad. That was my idea because I said, I'm not going to ask God's forgiveness at the foot of the cross and not be able to forgive you. I told my dad that. And a lot of you, the reason you turned out the way you did is because you have bad childhoods like I did. That's the reason, but that's not an excuse. Because in Christ, it's always a new beginning. That's what he specializes in. So I thought, I'm not going to be able to stay a virgin and get married the way I'm headed here. Because for some reason, good-looking women were coming around me. And I was noticing them. So I came up with a plan. As soon as they got in the car, I said, you want to go out? Yeah, let's go out. As soon as they got in the car, I said to every one of them, I said, I want to explain something to you from this point forward. I'm going to love Jesus more than I'll ever love you. But I will never do anything inappropriate and if i try i want you to stop me because i'm looking for a woman that will help me get to heaven and i'm going to help her get there the first girl i said that to opened the door got out and slammed it <laughs> i said well that's a time saver <laughs> but my wife said well you're just the kind of guy i'm looking for now, I acted cool, I thought. But inside, I was thinking, oh, boy. <laughs> Home run. And so my wife and I, to this day, have nothing in common. Nothing. <laughs> Except Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a walking testimony that that's all you need. And out of respect for her, I don't look at porn. I ain't into that. I, I just went all in with this one woman. And I, I'm not going to believe the lie that somehow or another it's greener on the other side of the yard. Because I know from my dad, he's told many stories. He said, it ain't greener, it's meaner. <laughs> the greatest sex on earth is God sanctioned between a man and his wife. God's way is always the best way. I'd love to tell you that it was a romantic liaison and on our honeymoon night, it wasn't. It was more like a biological experiment. <laughs> Truth. But I got three kids. We figured it out. I didn't have to worry about getting a disease. I didn't have to worry about some kind of comparison free. Now, was it hard? Yeah, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. We prayed. Look, I cried. First time I ever cried 
was over battling temptations while dating my wife. It's not easy. None of this is easy. You say, what do you do? Here's my challenge. I'm not going to ask you to respond tonight so you know I'm not a preacher. I'm not going to ask you to give any money tonight. I know he's not a preacher now. (laughs) Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, every person in here. This is my advice, and this was the greatest thing I did while on the earth. I want you to go home and get you a Bible. Don't do it on the cell phone. That's too close to the to the enemy. Get you a Bible, and you read the book of John. Don't read it like you're going to take a test. I want you to ask one question. What is Jesus like? Everybody got the assignment? You go home, you read the book of John. What is Jesus like? Because if you're going to say Jesus is Lord, I accept Jesus. So a lot of you have done that. You're not living Jesus as the Lord of your life. Be honest. We're looking around saying, I know one thing, that guy ain't a Christian. Well, he said Jesus is Lord. Read the red letters and see what he's like. And then if you fall in love with Jesus, you surrender to Jesus Christ and then show people that's what happened. And then you'll memorize, I guarantee you, always be prepared to give an answer. Everyone asks you to give the reason. And they say, how come you act different? How come you how come you don't do that? Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. Hey, if he can do it for me, if he can use us, he can use you. So if I don't see you again, I plan on seeing you. Oh, we're gonna do it. I'm gonna see you. Hey, we'll be back. So don't be surprised when Jesus comes back. Thanks for listening.